Now, some polymers, when if they're regular in structure, can give us a, an additional uh, packed arrangement that is very regular. So here is polyethylene again, where you can see the carbon atoms in gray and our hydrogen atoms in uh, kind of pink. And hopefully you can see from this visual that there's a unique and predictable pattern for these three separate neighboring chains. Um, actually four, one, two, three, and four, that ultimately are packed in a perfect arrangement where a mathematical process could predict where the next carbon atom is, where the next hydrogen atom is, and ultimately we would settle on something called a unit cell to help us visualize the minimum repeating feature that can describe that pattern in all three dimensions. So there's the unit cell of a crystal of polyethylene. <clears throat> so here we have an ordered atomic arrangement involving molecular chains. The crystal structure is, in terms of unit cell, is, is indicated down below. And we've seen that it's the polyethylene unit cell. Okay, so even though polymers are often kind of cartooned as noodles, they can pack and crystallize in very regular formats like we've seen with metals and even ceramics. Okay, so what does that model look like? Well, we've seen a moment ago that there's a unit cell and that chains are often quite parallel to one another as they pack. And so extending from that model out further to ultimately building out towards the bulk object, we'll take a look at that. So what do crystalline, crystalline regions look like? The model is a chain folded structure to explain that. So what you'll see here is that one polymer chain, so the sort of long primary bonded noodle that we've been describing, will ultimately, if carefully uh, cooled from the right temperature, would fold on itself and pack next to its chains per the conditions of the unit cell, so per spacing and arrangement of atoms. So this could be not four different chains, but it could be the same one where the, ch the one chain has looped on itself and packed back in to the lattice and then packed to another site and then ultimately packed back in. <clears throat> okay, so that's what we're showing here is for the chain folded model. Okay, so you can see here that there's that unicell on the previous slide might only represent a very small piece of this, and several unit cells would stack up ultimately to the point where the folding, which isn't representative of the pattern of atoms in the unit cell, would break away from that pattern would be regarded as more of an amorphous loop or hook that brings the chain back into the structure. So what we're looking at here ultimately is what's called a thin platelet with chain folds at the faces. And this platelet is also sometimes termed a lamelle. Lamelle. Lamella. <coughs> or plural lamelle. And they they again, would be very thin. So notice the thickness here, 10 nanometers. We'll rewind and look at our unit cell. And so our unit cell there was about a quarter nanometer. Okay, so there might be four unit cells to a nanometer. So it looks like there might be upwards of 40 repeat unit, or 40 unit cells to build up the thickness of this lamella. Okay, and so clearly you could have many chains coming together in here. This, this cartoon um, doesn't necessarily emphasize that, but we could have hundreds of chains establishing one lamella um, for the crystallization. Okay, so you can actually visualize this. Here's a nice electron micrograph of a multi-layered single crystal of a chain folded structure of polyethylene. So you can see the sort of sheet-like shape of the structure. Uh, you could imagine the thickness of these kind of sheets would be on the order of 10 nanometers in size. And what you can't see, but you could now in, in visualize here, is what the chains are doing to give us these sheets that are visible in this material. <clears throat>
what we're seeing in this micrograph, by the way, is what's called a single crystal. So you can see that the dimensions of it are very reflective of the ultimate structure that we have here. And that um, there is no kind of break away from the, the structure ultimately. There's no um, indications that in the sheet there's a um, mismatch between our folded arrangement of the chain. So this is what we mean, it's a single crystal. There's very little content. Perhaps only the faces of the sheet are not representative of what the unit cell describes. Okay. And so something like this can only be achieved if the material is slowly, slowly, and carefully controlled in its crystallization or cooled very slowly or the solvent conditions to allow the chain to transfer from a dissolved state to a packed crystal form would have to be done very carefully, perhaps over the course of weeks or months to do this. Not, not necessarily uh, practical, but nonetheless for a good fundamental result like this, it's been very, very impactful in defining the lamella for crystallization of polymers. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, as we might have inferred on that previous slide, generally what you do have in more practical uses of polymers is not purely crystalline material, but rather a balance between that crystal structure and more of the amorphous region that we hinted at in the faces of the lamellae that were those loops. Okay, so in this diagram, what we're seeing is that one polymer material with many chains that are identical, there could be molecular weight variation, but the, the repeat unit is identical, that some of those chains can crystallize according to the model we have for the lamellae, and many chains may not. And so we can have large sections that are amorphous, as we kind of see in the diagram, large sections that are amorphous, and bounding uh, as a boundary acro uh, across a boundary to the neighboring regions, we may have those crystalline regions. Okay, so polymers are rarely 100% crystalline. We, it's very difficult to control and crystallize all chains. And so we end up with the idea that most materials have a balance or a degree of crystallinity or percent crystallinity, meaning perhaps as the visual suggests here, maybe a third to half of the material is crystallized and the rest is in a more amorphous state, which is more disordered as we see it with the chains here represented by our, our noodles again. So heat treating causes, um, again, with careful selection of temperature, heat treating can cause crystalline regions to grow and increase the percent crystallinity. Uh, but if that temperature and the conditions aren't done just right, um, you may actually lose crystallinity. So it all depends on thermal transitions and the chemical definition of the polymer. Okay, so with that idea now, we can see what's more realistic. Instead of a single crystal like we saw in the electron micrograph, what do we actually see in most crystallizable polymers? So here's an example, an actual data set for or, or, pic, or image graphic for an isotactic polypropylene. So recall that this is similar to polyethylene, except that our, we now have a side chain. Okay, so we have a methyl side chain. And that methyl is isotactic. So the, the, ch the methyl groups are all on the same side. So that is to say they might all be coming out of the page at you whereas behind the page might be the hydrogen that satisfies the, the bonding for fourfold bonding at that carbon. So every repeat unit would have a methyl group coming out at, at you out of the page. This isotactic poly, polypropylene has been cooled from an upper temperature condition and ultimately gave rise to these results here. So here we see something more spherical. And so how do we explain this model knowing that polymers adapt these lamellae in their crystalline um, packed arrangements. So we need to think a little bit more in terms of three-dimensional aspects here, and we'll draw attention to the lines, which represent ultimately the lamellae that we have for the cartoon for. The purpose of the crossed polarizers is to use the crystals as 
um, an optical filtering element to allow light that would otherwise not um, make it between crossed polarizing filters, which would block all light. So if, if the crystals can interact with the light to twist plain polarized light, it can pass through an optical filter that would otherwise block it. And so here we've learned that these crystals can twist plain polarized light and allow them to come through a filter and shine bright to give us features on, on the micrograph. So in short, these fibrils that we're looking at emanating from a central feature here clearly represent some, uh, some lamellae that, that we need to learn more about for the three-dimensional material. <clears throat> okay, so these polymers that can crystallize, like we've seen here in the isotactic polypropylene, can build what are called spherulites. And so a spherulite is a structure that can be had for polymer, semi-crystalline polymers that um, are, are the result of fairly rapid cooling rates rather than that weeks to months long experiment that we saw earlier. <clears throat> okay, so what tends to happen is that nucleation of a lamellae for the chain folded model will occur. And at some point, the extension of this lamellae branches off into all three directions or to occupy all three dimensions of space in the material and we get a lot of hyperbranching of that lamellae structure. So the lamellae still exists here. You can visualize it here. We are seeing it in cross-section in this diagram. And it started at a nucleation site. Okay, so it looks like three lamellae ultimately are shown that have come from the common nucleation site in this, in this visual for us. Um, further branching can occur as those lamellae kind of extend further and further away from the nucleation site. And ultimately, those spherulites can impinge on one another. And we see that here, where ultimately interspherulitic boundaries, that is the boundary between one spherulite and another, exists. And um, this ultimately would be the result that we use to explain the result here. So you can see that... Um, three, several spherulites are shown where there's, you know, maybe one, two, three, perhaps a fourth was there, fifth spherulite, sixth spherulite shown in the polypropylene isotactic sample there. Okay, further detail. Even, so we see the, the sort of fibrils in here, perhaps even branching from one another, emanating from the common nucleation site. And what is between these lamellae branches? Well, we see that there is that amorphous material we knew was there. So perhaps, again, the spherulite might only be maybe 40% crystallized material. The remainder would be amorphous. The amorphous, again, has disordered chains between those lamellae structures. And the amorphous material isn't necessarily just the ends, the little dangling remnants, remainders of the chain, but we can actually have what are called tie molecules. So a single chain may pack into one lamellae, bridge across randomly and disorderedly until it can pack back into another lamellae. And that would be a tie molecule where one component of the chain is packed into one lamellae, and that same chain via an amorphous region as a bridge, that same molecule has ha had its other end, if you want, packed into another lamellae, perhaps on a branch or on another lamellae emanating from a common nucleation site. Okay, <clears throat> so in general, because um, we see that most, most polymers don't fully crystallized but adopt some balance between the amorphous and crystalline, we refer to them as semi-crystalline. So polymers that can crystallize, we refer to as semi-crystalline polymers, and they form spherulitic structures like we've seen. Okay, so hopefully that model helps you visualize what uh, we saw earlier for the polypropylene.
Okay, so what can affect the percent crystallinity? Uh, it can be determined by the rate of cooling during the solidification process. So recall, this might be the way that we reuse or set the, for the first time one of our thermoplastic materials. So how, what that upper temperature was used for processing the material, what the cooling rate was, um, what, what the cooling temperature, to what temperature it was cooled, all of those factors will affect um, how chains move and the time they're given to move and align and to pack into these lamellae and ultimately add to the spherolytic lamellae that we saw a moment ago. The Mer complexity. So what we mean by this <clears throat> is that in simple polymers, such as polyethylene, where there's very, well, where there's common side chains that are all the same, in the case of hydrogen, this would be very easy to pack. But as we put more complexity in the Mer, put a random side chain, as in atactic polypropylene, that random methyl group would prevent polymers from packing in a regular way as the methyl group would be in an unpredictable spot as it's trying to install itself in a unit cell and ultimately add to the lamellae structure. So if the, com if the structure is quite complex, um, either in its random side chains, touching on tacticity, or uh, there's some large structure or some branching or some other uh, feature that exists in the side chain can be diff difficult to crystallize, especially given the time constraints that may exist on processing that material. Uh, chain configuration. So linear polymers can crystallize quite easily, but again, if branches um, are present, they'll prevent that crystallization. Network polymers, again, they will almost always be completely amorphous because they are bonded so tightly in their primary bonding that they cannot shift and move at upper temperature um, and ultimately can't, can't try to crystallize. Um, <clears throat> now, some cross-linked, so that is where the number of bonds to the neighboring chains is quite low, not like a network polymer where the cross-linking content is quite low, uh, you can have some, crystalliz some crystallization, but uh, typically the amorphous piece there is, is more emphasized. Okay, so again, um, geometrical regularity at the MER at the repeating unit is going to help, so we touched on that earlier. Uh, Etactic materials are going to be difficult to crystallize. Uh, copoly copolymerization, so if we had, for example, polyethylene randomly, so I'll put a big slash here to indicate randomly including polypropylene, even if it were isotactic, okay, so this is a random copolymer, you can see that while we have the right tacticity in polypropylene, the fact that that methyl group is randomly occurring as we go down the linear chain, this copolymer is going to be very difficult to crystallize. Likewise, adding side chains um, that are chemically different than the main chain would be um, a barrier to crystallization. So a grafting of other molecules to the side, uh, side groups of a polymer chain would would prevent crystallization. Okay, and then when we have crystallinity, what are the properties like? Well, if we pack more matter into a, a smaller volume by crystallizing it, packing materials, atoms, and the primary bonds into a more dense structure, the, the material is going to be higher in actual mass density. So the gram per milliliter or the mass per unit volume value is going to be higher, higher density for crystalline uh, area of a polymer, and semi-crystalline polymers are generally more dense than any amorphous versions that might exist. Um, this, we're going to exhibit more strength. Those crystals are going to act just like the crystals that we studied for metals. So they are going to be, um, you know, very high modulus pieces and prevent <clears throat> plastic deformation um, at low forces or low stress. Um, so they'll also be a little bit more resistant to dissolution. So if we have to try to have a thermo 
plastic, like the bumper of a car, that can be resilient to solvents like oils and uh, cleaners and etc. They're going to be uh, more resistant to dissolving under the exposure to those those chemicals, um, and they're going to be resistant to softening by heating because there's going to be a requirement to melt the crystal if we're going to fully soften them.